Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, where you can also find us in the Birmingham Bloomfield area on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and on City Cable 15 of Southfield. Join us live on Channel 10 in Waterford every day on the media network of Waterford and live to tape on Channel 10 in Orion Township and Lake Orion on Orion Neighborhood Television, otherwise known as ON TV. You can also find us on the radio in the Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Troy areas on the Biff Radio Network 88.1 WBFH, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District, and find us online on our Facebook pages at Civic Center TV 15 and at Lakes FM on our website, civiccentertv.com. And beginning at 11 o'clock, you'll find us on My Michigan TV, otherwise known as My My, where you can also learn about downloading their free My My TV apps for your smartphone and smart TVs. But start that at 11 o'clock. All that information is on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you can also find all of our programs on demand in each individual interview as well. Then let's head over to our Corona coronavirus page, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where you have links to the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from re reliable expert resources at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Oakland County Health Division, so that you can stay updated on everything that you need to know about the spread of COVID-19 precautionary tactics, such as masking, social distancing, and so on, as well as vaccinations and booster shots. Keep yourself updated in your immunization against COVID-19. Also on the coronavirus page, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. We feature articles from many journalistic outlets all throughout the state of Michigan in order to keep you updated on COVID-19 and up to date on other stories making headlines across the state of Michigan. Today's top story from our friends at the Detroit Free Press. COVID-19 is delaying the trial in the plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The trial of four men accused of plotting to kidnap the governor that was scheduled to resume today has been postponed until at least Thursday because an essential part participant tested positive for COVID-19. U.S. District Judge Robert Jonker ordered the delay Sunday. Undercover FBI agents and informants were expected to testify in the coming weeks, as were two co-conspirators who pled guilty prior to trial as prosecutors build their case against four defendants accused of plotting to kidnap Governor Whitmer. The trial could last at least a month, pro probably more. In testimony last week, prosecutors sought to counter defense claims that four, uh, the four individuals were entrapped, tricked by the FBI into joining a kidnapping conspiracy that wouldn't have occurred to them otherwise. Prosecutors laid the groundwork of their case by calling FBI investigators to explain how they obtained covert recordings and social media posts. They entered some of that key evidence. On Thursday, jurors head for the first time, or sorry, heard for the first time a recording of one of the defendants specifically talking about kidnapping the Democratic governor. Barry Croft Jr. could be heard saying there should be a quote unquote quick precise grab of Whitmer. Jurors heard and heard him and defendant Adam Fox in social media postings and recordings ranting about purported government abuses and saying violence was a valid response. Prosecutors say Croft and Fox were plot ringleaders. Prosecutors said authorities arrested Fox, Croft, Daniel Harris, and Brandon Castera in October of 2020 to thwart the kidnapping and to ensure the men couldn't follow through on bids to buy powerful explosives. In 2020, 20, Governor Whitmer was trading taunts with then-President Donald Trump over his administration's response to COVID-19. Her critics regularly protested at the Michigan Capitol, clogging streets around the state house and legally carrying semi-automatic rifles in the Capitol building itself. Whitmer, who is seeking re-election this year, rarely talks publicly about the case and isn't expected to attend the trial. She has blamed Trump for uh, stoking mistrust and fermenting anger over COVID-19 restrictions and refusing to condemn hate groups and right-wing extremists who, uh, like those charged in this plot. She said that, uh, that he is complicit uh, complicit in the deadly January 6th Capitol insurrection in Washington, D.C. Also making headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. An interesting question raised by Bridge Michigan. Is federal COVID cash enough to solve Michigan schools' mental health crisis? It's an, this is an extensive article from Bridge Michigan. Highly encourage you to click on the, the link on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus so you can read this article in full. We don't have the full article. We're not going to go through the full article on this edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We 
will go through some of it, however. Two years of frustration, disruption, and loss have taken their toll on Michigan students, exacerbating a youth mental health crisis that has been building for more than a decade. Michiganders want schools to take action. Polls show and educators are stepping up to the challenge, drawing on research showing that emotional distress and student learning do not mix well. What a surprise. Michigan schools have no shortage of funds on hand thanks to $6 billion in federal COVID relief. And Governor Gretchen Whitmer is recommending a budget that includes an additional $361 million for student mental health. Yet it's not clear how far that money will go. Districts have hired social workers and counselors, selected new social emotional learning curriculums, and purchased therapy dogs. But students' needs are immense, and the pandemic rolled uh, and the pandemic rolled labor market is limiting districts' efforts to hire additional staff needed to, to undertake the task. At stake is the post-pandemic recovery of Michigan's youngest residents, not just emotionally, but also academically. Quote, we have kids that are chronically depressed and addicted, said uh, Paul Liebenau, executive director of the Michigan Elementary and Middle Schools Principal Association. Quote, there is a massive backlog of need, end close quote. Broad consensus on mental health says Michigan has taken notice of the mental health struggles of students like Kiana Tate. Students me included, she said, have been isolated. A senior at the Michigan School for the Deaf continued on, say, deaf, uh, continued on by saying, quote, I was stuck at home. A lot of times I was depressed. They don't know what it's like to have outside socializing just be snatched right from under us, and closed quote. For students like Tate, one solution is to hire more social workers and counselors. Many Michiganders would agree they put higher priority on addressing COVID funds according to a January poll conducted by Chalkbeat and the Detroit Free Press. Policymakers, too, have turned their focus to student mental health with budget proposals and efforts to revamp a health care system that lacks enough beds and providers to meet the needs of youth who are battling mental illness at growing rates. Yet schools are struggling to find mental health workers to hire. The pandemic caused turmoil in labor markets, adding to a shortage of trained school social workers that began years beforehand, said Kim uh, Betis, a professor at Michigan State University who trains school social workers. If districts can find someone to hire, Betis says, they, mu they must often find ways to train them on the job. It's like, and she says, quote, it's like, yay, we're getting money. Oh, no, we don't have people to fill these positions, and closed quote. Continuing on, she said, quote, school districts are hiring people who have never worked with a kid in their life as therapists in schools, and closed quote. COVID funds alone won't be enough to improve worker working conditions in schools, which have been deteriorating for years, making hiring more difficult, says Elizabeth Koshman, professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan and director of Trails to Wellness, a nonprofit that shares research-based mental health practices with schools. At the same time, as federal funds are becoming available, Michigan has a massive budget surplus with student activists calling for expanded mental health services in school in the wake of last year's shooting at Oxford High School. Governor Whitmer wants the state to invest an additional $361 million in student mental health. That proposal will likely be challenged by the Republican-led legislature, which proposes spending the surplus on a tax cut. Still, these new investments may not be able to keep up with the need for mental health services. Consider the grand Haven School District in western Michigan, where a string of six suicides between 2011 and 2017 spurred district leaders to expand their mental health staff to the levels that many other districts are trying to reach today. Even as districts in the area struggle to hire mental health workers, Grand Haven's larger staff is struggling to keep up with the mental health needs. Quote, we're seeing the trickle effects of constant chaos and the uncertainty of the pandemic, said Katie, uh, Katie Havey, a district social, social worker. Uh, we're needing more kids. We're seeing more kids needing major interventions. That we're doing more suicide screenings and seeing higher levels of threat assessments. Quote: It's crazy to reflect on all these things that we're doing really well and realize that we could still use so much more support. And close quote. Again, a very extensive article looking into school mental health uh, treatment needs throughout the state of Michigan, how federal COVID funds could play into that, where school districts are at, where the needs are at in terms of student mental health, and more from that article from our friends at Bridge Michigan. That is linked on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Lastly, making headlines today at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus from the Detroit News. Legendary Detroit Pistons announcer George Blaha has been sidelined for the remainder of the season and will undergo a heart procedure. Iconic Pistons play-by-play -play announcer George Blaha, who has been with the team for four 
46 seasons, will miss the remainder of the season as he prepares for a heart bypass procedure the Pistons announced on Sunday. After a routine checkup last week revealed an issue, Blaha's doctors scheduled the heart procedure for Tuesday, and they expect the 76-year-old to have a full recovery. Quote, I'm disappointed to miss the remainder of the season, but my health is the number one priority right now, and I have a great team of doctors guiding my short-term and long-term health, Blaha said in a statement uh, released by the team. Blaha continued on saying, quote, I'm grateful that they caught my issue early and they expect a full recovery. I look forward to getting back to full speed with rest and rehabilitation during the offseason and returning next year for my 47th season calling games for the Detroit Pistons, and closed quote. Blaha has been behind the mic for all three of the Pistons championship seasons, and, and he has become synonymous with the Pistons throughout each of their er, uh, eras. Quote, my thoughts and prayers go out to George. He's one of the best in the business, and he's seen almost everything in the business, both college and the pros said Pistons head coach Dwayne Casey before Sunday's game at Little Caesars Arena. Casey continued on saying, quote, he's a man's man and he knows the game. Thoughts and prayers to him as he goes through his health situation. We're going to miss him the rest of the season and my thoughts go out to him and his family, and close quote. From his trademark, quote, count that baby and a foul, and close quote, after a made shot to the familiar off the high glass well, Blaha has been for many Pistons fans what Ernie Harwell was to, to the Tigers fan, to Tigers fans, or what Vin Scully has been to the Dodgers faithful, a golden voice. Quote, George is part of our family, and he and his wife Mary have our full support every step of the way, said Pistons team owner Tom Gores in a statement. Gores continued on saying, quote, George is in the best of care and in great spirits. We join his many fans, friends, and colleagues in wishing him a full and speedy recovery. And closed quote. Blaha started his career with the Pistons in 1976 and has called more than 3,200 regular season games and over 260 playoff games. In 2008, he was inducted into the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame and he has received many awards, including the Ty Tyson Award for Broadcasting Excellence by the Detroit Sports Media Association and two-time Michigan Sports Broadcaster of the Year from the National Sportscaster Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association in both 2003 and 2007. Our, our thoughts, of course, with George Blaha and his family as he goes through this procedure. We wish him the best of luck and can't wait to hear him calling Pistons games again in his 47th season beginning next fall. All those headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, as well as those helpful links to accurate information from experts on COVID-19 at the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great program ahead today on this Monday Monday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Coming up, we'll be speaking with Kathleen Yannick from the Area Aging, uh, Agency on Aging 1B, followed by co-responder, clinician, and therapist Hillary Nussbaum at 1040. That's all next. This is the Oakland County Megacast. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just wanted to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there.
Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is a source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Joining us now is Kathleen Yannick, the communications manager at the Area Agency on Aging 1B, a shared Detroit-supported charity and nonprofit profit with us. Kathleen, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate Happy having you on. So the Area Agency on Aging 1B, uh, it, most people would think it has to, do, has to do with supporting those that are aging in our communities, but actually this, this agency provides a number of different services. So break it down for us, give us an overview of what the Area Agency on Aging 1B provides to our community. Sure. So, um, you know, we are a nonprofit. We've been around since 1974, so almost 50 years. We serve six counties here in southeast eastern Michigan, um, Oakland being one, of course, the others being uh, Livingston, Macomb, Monroe, St. Clair, and Washington. I hope I haven't forgotten any. Um, so, yes, we're all about helping seniors. Uh, adults with disabilities and family caregivers and our services are all about helping older adults stay you know living at home and giving them the support that they need to stay living with independence and dignity in the in the community um, we do that in lots of different ways and i'll kind of run through a uh, kind of a broad spectrum of our programs here but one of the most important things that we do is we have an information and referral telephone line and that that helps both seniors and family caregivers connect with um, services and supports in the community. And that can be services and supports that we're offering directly, or it can be um, services and supports and programs that are offered by other community organizations. And you can see the phone number right there uh, above my head, that 800-852-7795 phone number. Um, that phone number is really the front door to our agency. Uh, when you call, we have some wonderful resource specialists who are both very compassionate and very knowledgeable. They'll ask you questions, listen, try to understand what your situation is, uh, see if you might qualify for one of our programs or services, and if you do, kind of help you get started there. Uh, and also perhaps direct you to some other supports in the community. Again, that's the front door to our agency. Um, if you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember that that phone number is there to help you uh, and is really the first call that you should make if you or another uh, or another or an older adult that you know needs help um, another wonderful thing another program that we have is we have a couple of government funded uh, care programs that can bring care into the home to help with those you know activities of daily living that an older adult might not be able to do for themselves anymore so that's things like you know getting dressed um, you know, preparing meals, uh, you know, things like getting to the toilet, running errands, keeping the house tidy. So these care programs bring folks, you know, directly into the, to the home to help uh, older adults and adults with disabilities, you know, get that extra support they need to stay living at home. With our, um, with our care programs, it's important to remember that there are eligibility requirements. So that might be financial eligibility requirements related to your income and your assets. And it also can be uh, eligibility requirements related to um, the kind of care that you need. Um, what I really try to emphasize to folks is not to worry so much about those eligibility requirements at first and, and whether or not you'd qualify, um, but give us a call to see if you know this might be a program that could help you or your loved one um, and I am going to encourage you know folks that you know it, it's not only the senior that can call us it's also you know that family member that might be you know providing care or support they can call us as well and see if they can get their loved one started in one of our programs 
We also offer a wonderful um, transportation options program called My Ride 2. Um, so it's helping people who might not be able to drive anymore, um, either because you know they're older or because they have a disability. It's helping them connect with transportation resources out in the community. So we have a big database of transportation providers um, and you can give us a call and we will help figure and let us know where you need to go and when you need to go there. Um, we'll help you connect with the transportation provider that would be able to help. And we'll even arrange that ride for you. Um, so it's this really lovely concierge program that's doing all the lab work and helping people find those transportation options that can help them. Um, through that My Ride to Transportation program, um, we also have a partnership with the Ride Share program, Lyft. Uh, now, as you know, Lyft, you know, it really requires you to use a smartphone to schedule those rides. This can be really hard for um, older adults or people with disabilities. It might be difficult for you, them to use that smartphone application to do that. Um, so if you call our, our My Ride 2 program, we'll do that for you. We'll help schedule the ride, we'll help you arrange the payment. And so it really makes Lyft available um, to this whole you know, swath of folks that might not otherwise be able to use it and who really need those transportation options. Another thing that I'll tell you about Lyft is you're not just gonna get any old you know, Lyft driver, you're gonna get somebody who is you know, specially trained and vetted uh, to help serve older adults and help serve people with disabilities. So that's a fantastic program um, available to serve seniors here in, and people with disabilities here in Oakland County. Another wonderful program that we have is our Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program. Uh, and this program brings unbiased and free help um, to Medicare and Medicaid uh, beneficiaries. Uh, we've got a team of highly trained um, volunteer counselors and they get lots of training from CMS every year in our MAP program every year. They can help uh, Medicare beneficiaries compare programs, uh, make some really well-informed choices, maybe even save some money. Uh, they can help them troubleshoot problems or answer questions. Uh, right now, it's open enrollment for Medicare Advantage, and we've got volunteer counselors that are ready to help. Um, you know, that's happening through March 31st, and if you give us a phone call, if you give us a call, we're gonna help you um, connect one of, one of those volunteer counselors. That's we fun. also... Go ahead, I'm sorry. That phone number, 800-852-7795, 800-852-7795. You can also learn more information on the Area Agency on Aging 1B's website, aaa1b.org. That is triple A-1B.org. The number one is in there. Triple A, the number one, B.org for more information. We're joined by Kathleen Yannick, the communications manager at the Area Agency on Aging 1B. So uh, a lot of this goes uh, goes to senior uh, services for seniors, for those that may have disabilities and, and need some assistance in our community. But there's also great resources through your organization for caregivers also, because yeah. in many cases, it's a family member, it's, it's a close confidant of the person in need, and they may not know what they're doing. They may not know entirely what they're doing, and that's a Situation. They're learning it as they're going and trying to help this person that they love. Absolutely. But there are resources out there through this agency and, and through others. But for your agency specifically, what resources are there to assist caregivers in providing that uh, tender, loving care to that loved one of theirs uh, without being necessarily an expert in caregiving? Yeah, so, you know, caregiving can be you know, as you know, really rewarding, but it can be overwhelming too. Um, so that's one of these things that we're doing is we're providing that support for family caregivers. Um, we're doing this in a couple of ways. Uh, one, we have a really amazing uh, evidence-based class called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. And that is a six week workshop. You meet uh, once a week for six weeks uh, with other folks who are kind of um, going through the same thing that you're going through. And the class is really all about helping caregivers learn to, you know, take care of themselves. Like, 
taking care of a loved one because that's, you know, sometimes people kind of put themselves on the back burner. They get really stressed. They get really overwhelmed. Um, there can be some really complicated emotions that sometimes go along with caregiving. So that class can kind of help you learn how to how to take care of that. Um, we also have a brand new program called Caregiver Coaching uh, that I absolutely love. And this program pairs um, volunteer uh, coaches, really compassionate volunteer coaches with a caregiver. And this caregiver or this coach is gonna kind of help that person uh, through their journey. They're gonna be uh, someone to listen to them, uh, someone to you know kind of give them a shoulder to lean on. They're gonna help them find resources. They're gonna be that you know sounding board if somebody's got difficult decisions to make and, and they're confused about what to do next. Um, so they're, you know, we call them, they're, they're really cheerleaders, lifter uppers, and problem solvers is kind of what I describe them as. Um, and you can go on our website and find out how to connect with that program. You can also call that phone number, that 800-852. 7795 uh, phone number and we'll get you connected with one of our caregiver coaches. It's a brand new program, um, but it's it's a really exciting program and I'm really glad that we're able to give um, you know caregivers that one-on-one -on -one support that they really need because it can be really tough. So Kathleen, we got we got one minute left with you today. I want to give you an opportunity. Oh you mentioned some of the volunteer opportunities to uh, provide uh, help to caregivers. What are some of the other volunteer opportunities available through the Area Agency on Aging 1B? Yeah, so I, I mentioned our Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program. We're always looking for volunteers uh, to join our MAP program as well. Um, just need to be willing to learn and willing to give us some time and you can help, you can help really save beneficiaries lots of money. So it's really rewarding. Well, Kathleen, we thank you so much for joining us. Anything else before we let you go that would be important for our audience to know or to be considering at this time about the Area Agency on Aging 1B? Uh, just please remember that we are here as a support to serve seniors, um, people, with adults with disabilities, and family caregivers, and we hope you give us a call. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is a source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. March is National Social Worker Month and joining us now is a co-responder clinician who partners with the Bloomfield Township, Auburn Hills, and Birmingham Police Departments in order to help citizens who come in contact with their local law enforcement. Hillary Nussbaum from Dr. Kendall and Associates joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Thank you for being with us, Hillary. Thank you. Appreciate Great your, to be here. Yeah, appreciate your time. So you're a co-responder clinician and you're also a therapist at Dr. Kendall and Associates. Uh, can you tell us about your background and what led you to wanting to uh, go into this line of work, be a therapist, and, and help people in our local community? Uh, yeah, so I have a background um, as far as professionally um, in school social work. So I've been a school social work for 11 years prior to this job. Um, my stepfather was a, um, a public safety director out in Coldwater, Michigan, um, and he really inspired me watching him do his job. And um, I have, a, I guess, a, a knowledge that um, both military and law enforcement first responders um, really lack um, having any kind of um, 
you know, trauma training or background, you know, with, with when it comes to encountering mental health. So um, one of the things I've always wanted to do is work with law enforcement or first responders in some way, shape or form um, in my career. And so when this opportunity presented itself um, through Oakland um, Community Health Network, um, I threw my name in the hat and said, this is something I want to I want to go for. And so let's elaborate on, on that. You mentioned military and law enforcement and some of their issues with interacting with people that may have that may have uh, mental health concerns or may have mental health factors that are impacting their behavior. We've heard so much about reform of law enforcement or greater training for law enforcement over the last couple of years. From your perspective, mm -hmm. having worked with law enforcement but also worked uh, in mental health capacity and as a social worker, what are some of those lacking areas that you help police departments and that you help others uh, sort of bridge those gaps in considering mental health and considering trauma in their approach to law enforcement? Yeah, I mean, I think pairing a social worker with police specifically, you know, just I can speak about my job. Um, police don't necessarily have the training and background in, um, you know, mental health disorders, um, certain types of like psychotropic medications that get used for, for disorders, um, trauma training, um, crisis de-escalation techniques. Um, those those are all skills that um, certain social workers have, and and a lot of mental health clinicians are are very aware of. So those are things that we can bring to the table to help out with police and pair with them. Um, I know that we are working really hard to help police get trained in some um, sort of mental health initiatives. So we have a crisis intervention um, training CIT. Um, that puts police through 40 hours of mental health training, which is wonderful because it just introduces them to certain skills that they can use while they're on the job. Um, and that's one thing that, that I know that Oakland County is really serious about um, trying to get some of these departments trained in that. And so uh, let's talk about the way that this sort of training can be effective or more effective than traditional uh, protocols in law enforcement for approaching uh, law enforcement situations, especially more tense situations uh, with, poten with potential uh, criminals or just people out, out in, in the community that may, be, uh, that may be causing a disturbance in any sort of moment. When you have that, that trauma training, that mental health training, and you're approaching that situation as, as an officer, fr from what you're training these officers and, other, and the CIT training that they're undergoing, how is that approach different from what they are traditionally utilizing as their approach to these sort of situations? I think traditionally police tend to have a, let's get to the call, let's problem solve as quickly as we can and make sure that, you know, like we get that person wherever they need to go and we move to the next call. Um, police have a lot of calls that come in. Um, and so they are constantly going from one call to the next. So I think, you know, historically police are trying to get through things as quickly and effectively as they can. Um, However, they haven't had the mental health resources. So part of CIT um, training is slowing down, um, especially when you're on a mental health call, um, really working on verbally de-escalating um, a situation, thinking about what the best approach is for how to handle a situation. Is the hospital the best place to take someone or should we be looking at uh, you know like common ground services or does that person already have therapy and maybe we just need to contact a clinician? So it's really just slowing down that problem solving a little bit and together, like me along with police, really thinking about like, what is the best course of action here? And even though it might take more time than a typical call, it's making sure that we're getting that person the best resources um, in the most effective way we can. And so how effective are these methods in A, de-escalating these sorts of situations that may be quite tense or, or even dangerous for the person involved as well as law enforcement and, and those in the surrounding areas? How, how effective are these methods in de-escalating those situations? And then on top of that, helping these individuals that may need greater assistance from their community to prevent them from returning to a similar situation in the future? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. We're actually collecting quite a bit of data on that right now. Um, one, of the, one of the big outcome measures that we're looking at is use of force. If we can lessen the use of force techniques used by police, then it's already positive. It's already being effective. Um, and we are seeing that, that there's 
um, less use of force um, on certain scenes, um, less arrests and more jail diversion, meaning trying to get people mental health help and resources if that's what they need. Um, we are working really hard on making sure that people have access to like Oakland Community Health Network um, gives access to many different providers. So we have a lot of data showing that people are getting connected to those providers um, and actually getting those resources that they need um, rather than police showing up and maybe just taking them to the hospital or sometimes they're just left under the care of themselves or another person. Um, and that has been the traditional way of doing things. So the data that we have currently is backing up, you know, that uh, having a mental health clinician is effective. And what has been the response from those in law enforcement that you are assisting with, the, with this training or that you are assisting in the response to these uh, different calls that they're going on? What's their response to what they've been experiencing in this different paradigm and, and how it's allowed them to do their job effectively? I've had a very positive response. I've been pleasantly surprised, um, you know, knowing that the police have such a, a family um, oriented, you know, nature among each other um, that to enter as an outsider um, is difficult. And so, you know, I've been really welcomed quite warmly and have had a great response. Um, I get I get called the scenes a couple times a day when I'm working and I get a lot of referrals from police to follow up with individuals and um, I'm beginning to form those relationships with officers, with detectives, <clears throat> with police staff, just to um, begin really working more efficiently together. So that's been, it's been a really great experience so far. We're joined by Hillary Nussbaum, co-responding, uh, co-responder clinician and therapist at Dr. Kendall and Associates, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information uh, from Dr. Kendall and Associates on their website, drkendallandassociates.com. Kendall with one L at the end, drkendallandassociates.com. And and so, has the COVID-19 pandemic had? How has the COVID-19 pandemic had an impact? on the necessity for greater mental health services in our community. And, and then with that response, how has that impacted not just a local police, but also public safety and the community approach to mental health in general? Well, I think COVID-19 has had a major impact um, on mental health. I think it's raised anxiety across the board. Um, when I work for the schools, we've seen a major impact with kids um, having higher anxiety. Um, families being at home together and working from home um, creates more, um, I guess, family trouble type situations coming up. Um, you know, there's more, when you have more people packed into a house, you know, it can create more um, more problems along the way. So certainly the, the anxiety has, has raised. I think there's been um, economic issues. People have lost jobs. Um, there's been quite a bit of disturbance from COVID-19 for obvious reasons, but that also increases stress for families and individuals. And that's more calls to 911 and more calls to police to come to their home to help out. So um, police are definitely seeing it, I think across the board and seeing the rise in mental health cases in need. And I think that's why they're very happy to have um, a mental health clinician come along and try to help take some of that load. And so, Hillary, take us to the scene of these calls when you and with off, when officers or, or other law enforcement officials are responding to these calls. You get on site. You have some information, maybe about the about the person or the people that are involved in, in the disturbance that's being called in. But you may not have the full the full story to really be able to approach this person with the care that's necessary, but also the caution that's necessary for them, for the officers in the greater community. So, where does that mm -hmm. approach start? In, in this particular methodology when you get on site to these calls? Yes, yeah, so kind of from point A through Z, um, police will, I carry a prep radio just like a police officer. So they're able to let me know if a scene is safe for me to approach or not. Um, if it's not, then I wait for them to essentially make sure that the scene is safe. Um, when I approach, usually an officer will greet me and kind of give me a quick rundown of the situation um, and then let me know how I can be most useful. And so. Um, when I enter that scene, you know, and try to talk to that individual, I might help de-escalate a situation. I may be working with 
the officers and trying to problem solve, like, what's the most effective path for this person moving forward? You know, are we looking at common ground? Are we looking, are we just able to deescalate and leave that individual here um, with resources? Or um, like, what's the most effective way, you know, kind of moving forward? So together we kind of problem solve um, and make a plan and then and then go from there. So walking into a scene, um, you know, usually I have a little bit of information from dispatch and then that officer will greet me and sort of tell me what's going on. And um, it's been, it's it's gone pretty smoothly for the most part. I mean, we are both learning each other. I'm learning the police world, police are learning, you know, how I can be useful on a scene. So um, we're, we're, we're learning that together. We're joined by Hillary Nussbaum from Dr. Kendall and Associates, joining us on the Megacast, a co-responder clinician and also a therapist with Dr. Kendall and Associates. I want to give you a few minutes to talk about uh, the work that is done at Dr. Kendall and Associates and some of the services that people in our community, as well as organizations in our community, can utilize through, uh, through this company. Sure. So uh, I have a private practice with Dr. Kendall and Associates, um, and they specialize um, with anxiety, trauma, um, they work with children ages zero through 18. Um, they have a nurse practitioner on board that can help with medication purposes. So it's really a um, come one, come all um, type service. We really try to reach um, as many different um, cohorts of people as we can. Um, I, I think it's also important to say that I am an employee of Oakland Community Health Network, which has allowed me to do this job with police. Um, and work with them. And so they've really um, opened up this this position and they're really working with Oakland County Police to um, allow more clinicians to be involved. So they have providers like Easter Seals, um, community, um, you know, a lot of community providers and those kinds of things that can help with um, services for individuals. So uh, lastly, before we let you go, if our viewers are having mental health issues themselves, they're noticing their mental health slipping or they're having some issues maintaining their mental health, or they know someone in their life that, that is, what are those first steps that they should be taking to get help from someone like yourself or other professionals, uh, Dr. Kendall and Associates and other organizations locally and across Michigan uh, if they are in, in need of help? I mean, certainly what I would do is start with whatever insurance that individual has, um, and there should be a number on the back and they can call and see what providers actually will work with them so they don't hit a lot of barriers um, in trying to receive services. If you don't have insurance, um, you can contact Easter Seals um, and they can try to help you get um, services, you know, that way. I would say Oakland County has an access program um, and they are kind of the front door to getting services for anybody in Oakland County who needs it. So I would contact Access. Um, you can just Google that, um, and they, are, they work with Oakland Community Health Network. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us, Hillary. Thank you. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. 
make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 72.7% of high school students get less than the recommended 7-9 to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent 7-9 to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes FM. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water, and so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help. We may come from different organizations. But we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there is a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. We as Michiganders feel connected to this resource in a way that I think is really powerful. Conservation starts with a caring, committed community. For me, you know, it's peaceful to have a relationship with the river. Every single one of us has a role to make sure that those waterways stay safe and healthy, being careful about what goes down the storm drain. Just even eliminating some of your single-use plastic makes a difference. There's one water and it's ours to protect. Did you know that nearly 3.31 million Americans don't get their annual checkup? <laughs> Going to the doctor regularly is extremely important and is a crucial factor in maintaining good health. Make sure you are visiting your local doctor often and telling them about any health concerns you have. For more information, contact your local health care provider. This message is brought to you by WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes of Health. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. 
there's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Welcome to the Michigan MegaCast on your radio homes for the program 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast where you can find information on our entire network of stations including My Michigan TV, otherwise known as My My. The COVID-19 pandemic shined a bright light on the literacy gap here in Michigan and one local organization is looking, is looking to help get Michigan reading, giving away an astounding 50,000 books to the community. Give My Books Foundation Todd Whalen joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Todd, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you on with us. Uh, let's begin. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar uh, with Give My Books, can you talk about uh, Give My Books and, and what you've been doing, your organization's been doing with books and other media uh, in our community since 2008? Yeah, so Give My Books is our, uh, it's our family business. Uh, so what we've been doing is we've been picking up books from people who no longer need them or don't, for whatever reason, um, directly from people's homes, right off their front porch or another safe, dry location. Uh, so that way we collect them. And then as a family business, what we do is we sell them uh, to support our service and to support our family. But not all of them can be sold. So we give as many as possible back to the community. And we've been doing that through a number of different ways. And so, Todd, what inspired that giving portion of this operation? Ob obviously, the book the books that you can resell uh, f from your business side, you want to resell and, and make whatever you can off of them. But the ones that n may not be able to be resold, but may be useful to the community, they can come very much in handy to educators, to students that may not otherwise have access to those books. So where did that inspiration begin to start that effort? Yeah, that's good. So back when I started this uh, business, uh, I was a single dad. And so what started it was I was asking people for their books in order to support me as a single dad. Um, but then what I realized was that people, they love their, their books. They want to know that they're going to a good cause. So what we then did was um, just start giving them back. People are giving us books to support our family. So then we want to give back to the community. Um, I actually feel indebted <laughs> to the community for all the help that they've given through giving their books. So that's the reason why we definitely want to give back uh, to the community. More information on Give My Books is available at jlcbooksale.com, jlcbooksale.com to learn more information. Last year, gave, you gave away about 30,000 free books. And so that, that, it's got to be a massive effort uh, from your team in order to put this effort forward at all. And your goal this year is to surpass that 30,000 almost twice over. Uh, your goal is 50,000 books given away in our communities. So just how big of an effort is it? How many people are involved and, and the logistics that are involved in making this happen to get these books out into our community? Yeah. So there's a good amount of effort to this. Um, we've actually done a lot of the digital work using both the websites, uh, givemybooks.com and jlcbooksale.com. They work hand in hand. Uh, so what we've been doing is giving books directly to schools in bulk. So like each school, they can get two books per student that can be given directly to the students and then two books for the teacher for each of their students. So we're basically just dropping off bulk uh, shipments to these different schools or organizations. That's one way we've been doing. But the way that we've modified things now 
is so that individuals in the community can get free books using the online checkout process through JLC Book Sale to, to schedule their time to come pick them out. Uh, and they get free the free coupon through Give My Book. So it takes a good amount of people to set this all up, but we've actually automated most of the process that we can now get down to running it with just myself and we have five other people who run the whole business together. We're joined by Todd Whalen, the founder of Give My Books. More information in a couple of places, jlcbooksale.com, as well as uh, givemybooks.com, where you can learn more information about both the JLC Bookstore and learn more information about Give My Books, how you can get involved, how you can help them out, as they aim to give 50,000 books away to the community for free this year in, the, in this effort. And so uh, you're based out of Washtenaw County, and, and for the most part, this effort has been based in Washtenaw County, with the goal now expanding from 30,000 books that was the end result of approximately last year to your goal this year for 50,000 books. How is that effort going to change? Are you expanding outside of your local area in Washtenaw County to surrounding counties? Yes, absolutely. So what we've done now is we are having parts of Livingston County, Oakland County, Wayne, and Monroe counties. Uh, so basically from where we're at, it's a 30 mile, about approximately 30 mile radius uh, that we have expanded our pickup area uh, and thus helping us to get more books so that we can actually give away more books. What's the response been like in the community year after year as you are giving these books mm. away? Because I, because there, there seems to be, off the top of my head, there would be a couple of different places these books would go. They go to individual families that may struggle financially, not be able to afford getting new books and, and keeping their children and their families engaged in reading and in that creative mindset that comes from reading these books, but also to, to teachers and, and schools throughout our, our multiple county area that this is going, this effort's going to be put forth in that we've seen, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, have had to really tighten their budgets. And often for these educators, even outside of the times of COVID, they're often buying these books out of pocket. So free books can be immensely helpful. What's the response been like from the community in Washtenaw County since 2008, as you've been doing this effort to provide these books for free in your community? Yeah, the response has been fabulous. Uh, we've had utter appreciation for what we're doing, uh, especially like you mentioned, teachers, they buy their own books. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge burden, really. Uh, and then especially we found out during the pandemic uh, not everybody had access to books. They couldn't access. They couldn't get their school libraries and things like that. So there's a big need for uh, books to be given, especially over different economic zones. You know, not everybody makes the same amount of money and can afford books. So th them being given free has. We've received so many either letters of appreciation, even from schools. I, one of my favorite things ever was getting a handwritten card from a bunch of uh, little uh, elementary school kids in their own handwriting. I mean, that touched my heart. So we've had a tremendous response from the community in what we're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that that helps uh, in these individual classrooms too to mix up and, and break up these lessons and give a more extensive look from the literacy standpoint in these classrooms and of course giving that ever necessary relief, especially financially, to teachers. Uh, I, and I know from, from the experiences of my aunt who is a, an elementary school teacher at Brick Elementary in Ypsilanti over there in Washtenaw County that the expenses that our teachers are putting forth just to do the bare minimum at the very least to teach their the kids in their classes every year is immense. And so having these opportunities, not only does it help the teachers financially, and that's great, it really helps to enrich that learning experience for the kids as well. Mm -hmm. It's very true. And one other thing, I, uh, oh, how was I gonna mention? Oh yeah, the Ypsilanti Community Schools to help them yeah, even in Ypsilanti Community Schools. Oh, th this is what I was going to say. This is an ongoing thing. This isn't just because it's 50,000 books, poof, we stop. We want teachers every year to continue to get books for their students, their new students, and have new books for their own classroom. So this is an ongoing thing. Yeah, we have a goal of 50,000 this year, but that's just us getting started. 
<laughs> we just had to set a goal and that was a good goal to start. Yeah, if you're able to get 30,000 books, that jump to 50,000 with that effort in the community, especially as you expand out, that's a good baseline, but you can get a lot further than that, especially if you have the kind of effort that obviously you've had from the community mm -hmm. over these many years that Give My Books has been going on. Todd Whalen joins us. He's the founder of Give My Books. More information, givemybooks.com, as well as JLC Book Sale. Dot com and so uh, of course JLC book sale is uh, it, uh, is connected to your bookstore and you're able to sell books through that business and if, if books aren't flying off the shelves there's an easy there's an easy out there you put them in to give my books you're giving them away in the community someone's going to enjoy that content but other than than that directly from your uh, from your business operation where are the rest of these books coming from uh, the books where do they come from they come from the community they're a hundred percent from the community um we we actually don't buy any books uh and so because people give these to us um they we pick up directly from people's front porches or from their you know they put their books in their garage for us and they just schedule online at givemybooks.com uh we also have um people that have used us like thrift stores uh nonprofits. um we have universities there's a whole list of even uh, organizations that use our libraries. We actually pick up for a whole bunch of libraries uh, throughout all of Southeast Michigan. So not just individual homes, but that does make up the majority as we picked up from thousands and thousands of people over these last 13 years. We're joined by Todd Whalen. He is the founder of Give My Books, an effort that, that uh, is hoping to uh, raise 50,000 different books to spread throughout the community for free to different organizations and individuals in, in Washtenaw County and, and as well in surrounding counties also including Livingston, Oakland, Wayne, and Monroe counties. He joins us on the MegaCast. More information on givemybooks.com. And so if people are interested in donating books, what's the best way for them to go about uh, getting in contact with you and, and going through that process of collecting those books and ultimately getting them into circulation so they can be distributed in our communities. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So the best way is to use our website, uh, givemybooks.com. You'll find the uh, pickup request form on there. It's a very simple form, just your name, address, the basic information that we need, uh, and then you schedule your own date. Uh, each zip code has a zone, so we pick up on certain days depending on which zip code you're in. Uh, and then you just fill out the form, and what you'll get, you'll get a confirmation email that you're on our schedule along with instructions that you'll need for the book pickup. Uh, then the day of the pickup, all you do is leave your books or other items out on the front porch or any other safe dry location that you told us. Uh, and then we'll come by between 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night, and we'll come and pick all those books up. Um, and then you'll even get a reminder email the day before you have a pickup, and we'll confirm that we did a good job afterwards with a, an email saying, hey, did we get your books? And then that'll complete the transaction. That's how they get into back into circulation. We're joined by Todd Whalen from uh, Give My Books. You can learn more information, givemybooks.com, as uh, Todd uh, is the founder of the of the organization. You can also learn more information on jlcbooksale.com. Book, uh, We're joined by Todd Whalen, founder of Give My Books. And so we talk about uh, getting involved in, in the donation. What about in the distribution? If people would like to help Give My Books, distribute the, uh, collect and distribute these books, how can they get involved with volunteer opportunities? Mm. Yeah, so if uh, anyone wants to um, be involved with that, they can uh, contact us through uh, our website or just a direct email, actually. So I'm Todd, so Todd at givemybooks.com uh, is a great way. That's my email address. Um, and if you absolutely need to, you can find our phone number on the website, which you can call or text and let us know that you are uh, interested. Uh, in, in helping, and we'll work that out. We definitely need volunteers, especially for our summer book program that we may speak about. So 50,000 books, 30,000 last year, 50,000 is the base goal for this year's effort. Uh, they're going to a number of different places throughout our communities uh, and, and helping a whole lot of people. If people are in need, if they're teachers, if there are organizations, if there are individual families that are in need of some books, how can they get? How can they go about getting those books through this effort as you're giving away f thousands of books for free in our communities? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, there's there's two different ways at the moment. Uh, one is going to givemybooks.com. There is a teacher request form that can be filled out. And uh, that also includes homeschool families or really anybody who wants them. That's just a request form for you to get free books from us. 
And what happens is, especially if you're a teacher or uh, organization, once we verify all your information and we approve you, we send you a coupon code that you can then uh, use for JLCBookSale.com. If you, if you have bo uh, bulk books, we'll drop them off. But if you are just getting, say, 10, 20, 40 books, you can schedule a time to come pick them out yourself. Uh, so that's how uh, people can get those books if they want them. What's really interesting about this effort, Todd, and and what's a really fast, truly really fascinating aspect of the Give My Books effort is that you're collecting all these books and you're storing them and you're running this operation out of your own home. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It, it certainly is. <laughs> that's that, that's wild to think about. That you have th these thousands of books coming into circulation through this effort that at any, t at any given time theoretically would be in your home. How you how are you able to manage? that having that operation out of your home and then helping so many people and not only now just in washington county but in surrounding counties too yeah it's a challenge so what we did is at our home we built a uh, 864 square foot pole barn that serves as our warehouse uh, and then my parents garage where jlc book sale is um well i should say at my parents house which is two courts down from ours we made their garage into a bookstore that's where the year-round JLC bookstore is, where people can come pick out those books. But at our own home, the key really is we can process a whole bunch of books because nothing really stays at our place. They're all processed and they are sorted and sent out back into the community, either to other bookstores, to other booksellers, or given away back into the community through what we've been talking about. We're joined by Todd Whalen, founder of Give My Books. You can learn more information in a couple of places, jlcbooksale.com or by visiting givemybooks.com. And if you'd like to get involved through donations, if you'd like to obtain some of these books for your classroom, for your local organization, for yourself or, or someone that you know who may be in need of these books, you can uh, get in contact with Todd. Todd at givemybooks.com is his email or visit givemybooks.com uh, and you can get in contact with him that way. So, uh, Todd, another another thing on the JLC side, uh, your summer book sale events are coming up. Can you tell us about these events? I understand that they're held in your backyard. When can we expect this to be happening and uh, what what's the fun in all of this? That's right. Actually, it's tremendous fun. It is a whole, it's a lot of fun. We, we've set it up so that throughout all of our property, we use our front yard, our driveway, side and backyard. We put out 15 to 20,000 books and we categorize them. So, uh, you know, you have your kids, uh, fiction, uh, uh, nonfiction books. Uh, so they're easily found and it's enjoyable. So every book is a dollar. The sales last from Wednesday to Saturday. Um, but Wednesday is a special day because it's a teacher's only day where they come and they get the best selection and they also get 10% off um, of the already inexpensive books. But uh, then everyone else can come. It's a, it's a huge event that we usually have. We do them four times a year, our summer events, in May, June, July, and August. Um, so when we do those, uh, we have usually two to 3,000 people that come to each one of those sales at our home <laughs> in three days. So it's a, it's a well-organized, uh, very fun event where people can get their books and it's very enjoyable. More information on givemybooks.com or jlcbooksale.com to learn more about uh, Give My Books effort aiming to to give away 50,000 free books at the bare minimum. Uh, this year, JLC Book Sale will be holding its summer book sale events uh, from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m. at 2091 Stratton Court in Ann Arbor. The following dates will be Wednesday, May 18th through Saturday, May 21st, Wednesday, June 22nd through Saturday, June 25th, Wednesday, July 20th through Saturday, July 23rd, and Wednesday, August 24th through Saturday, August 27th. In addition to books, uh, Give My Books also collect uh, and sells DVDs, audiobooks, video games, puzzles, and board games. Books are available for $1 each at the summer event. We're joined by Todd Whalen, founder of Give My Books, and also from JLCBookSale.com on, on the Michigan Megacast. Todd, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye. Anything else at this time that would be important for our audience to know about JLC Book Sale or, of course, about Give My Books? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the biggest things I want everyone to know right now is... Uh, uh, a, a coupon code that we are giving out to everybody. This is to jumpstart our uh, giving away efforts. So there, there's one per person, the limit on it, but it's 10K free book giveaway. So it's 10K, 10K free book giveaway 
that is the coupon code that the first thousand people that use that coupon code on jlcbooksale.com the books it's a basically a twelve dollar coupon because ten books cost twelve dollars but uh you get your 10 books free and we're doing that for the first 1,000 people and that jump starts us with 10,000 books being a given given away just as soon as we have a thousand people who are interested that code 10k free book giveaway 10k free book giveaway give my books.com or jlcbooksale.com todd thank you so much for joining us I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, more information, givemybooks.com so you can join in on the effort. Donate those books, help with distribution, or if you're in need of these books in your classroom, in your home, or, or if you know of a need anywhere else in your community, great place to start, givemybooks.com. We'll take a break. On the other side, we'll visit what should be ranked as USA Today's best science museum in the country, but it's just slightly ranked a little bit lower than a museum in Ohio. Gross. There's a way that you can help, and Dr. Christian Greer will join us to talk about that next. This is the Michigan Megacast. Parents do a lot of worrying. Get your kids caught up on childhood vaccines to protect them from these 14 preventable diseases, and you'll have 14 fewer things to worry about. Vaccines are safe and effective and save lives. So let's get caught up on vaccines and worry about something else. Get the facts at iVaccinate.org. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Most of the pollution that goes into our rivers is carried by rainwater that flows off of roads, parking lots, and rooftops. The leaves and bark of a single tree can retain a surprising amount of rainwater. Depending on its size and species, it could be 100 gallons or more. It is estimated that an urban forest can reduce annual runoff by up to 7%. Here's one thing that we know can help keep our water clean. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Joining us now is Dr. Christian Greer, the president and CEO of the Michigan Science Center, which is competing for the title of USA Today's Best Museum in the U.S. Dr. Greer, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Lord, it's good to be with you. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. I appreciate having you come on. So currently the leaders in the USA's, uh, USA Today's Top 10 Best Museums contest, uh, the Michigan Science Center is number two. It's surrounded by, uh, by science centers and museums in the state of Ohio. And I say state in quotations because Ohio's, <laughs> why, why are we even giving notice to them? The number one currently, not for very long, is the Center for Science and Industry in Columbus, Ohio, a far inferior museum to the Michigan Science Center. And number three is the Great Lakes Science Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And of course, Ohio is the place that invented stepping on Legos. So we want to make sure the Michigan Science Center I love it. <laughs> wins 
wins <laughs> this contest. Uh, tell us about the, the Best 10 Science Museums contest through USA Today. And, uh, of course, there's going to be great promotion for the Michigan Science Center for being in that top 10, anywhere in that That's top right. 10. But what is the benefit of winning this contest? Well, I, the, the, as you mentioned, Tyler, the, the benefits are, 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 are really great. And it's an honor. It's really an honor to be uh, listed among the, the top 10. The USA Today has a 10 best they do in their travel section for lots of different things, for restaurants and for national parks and our art museums and other kinds of cool stuff. But in the Science Museum section for the last two years, we have been nominated at the Michigan Science Center. And uh, it's such an honor to be in there with so many great organizations that are bigger than ours. They have bigger budgets. They have all this and we're right up at the top and i have to tell you i've gotten so many calls from my colleagues at cosi and at the great lake science center um, that we work with in ohio and they're wondering just how we do it here in michigan but this is what we do this is how we take care of business so uh we were uh, kind of going back and forth and fighting for number one uh we've been number one or number two for the last three weeks and I have to say that that's exciting. Last year for 2021, we ended up listing as number four, and uh, I never thought we would get this high, uh, you know, uh, so quickly. But we jumped up the ranks because of all of you out there that have been voting for us. We really appreciate it. And so, uh, what it does for us is it just raises our profile and lets people know that that Michigan and our science center here is a force to be rec reckoned with nationally, <laughs> and they get a chance to see all the cool stuff that we do. Like right behind me uh, in the screen here is our planetarium. We have a planetarium, we have an IMAX theater, we have a 4D theater, a Toyota 4D engineering theater, we have a science stage. We have lots of cool things for people to see, and that's what makes us one of the top 10. And so if people haven't visited other museums from this top 10 list or, or haven't even gone to the Michigan Science Center, what really makes the Michigan Science Center so unique, not just on the on a local level here in southeastern Michigan where it's located, uh, on a state level in Michigan and, the, and regionally, but all across the U.S. and around the world? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, th this is probably the seventh museum that I've worked in in my career. Uh, it's been over 30 years, and I've visited tons and tons of science centers and museums because I'm just a geek about science centers and museums. I love the interactivity. I love the creativity and the way that they express and explain and communicate science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but the one thing I noticed when I showed up on my first day here <laughs> is that we play music in the galleries. Now, that might be a small thing, but when you think about Detroit as being a music city um, to be able to come in and like listen to music while you're doing science that was kind of cool and so i think what we do it's not so much um the the what we do because we do a lot of things that other scientists do it's more the way we do it we do it with flair we do it with style we do it with grace we do it with uh, uh, excitement and more than anything we want to demystify science and put you at the center of it and, and so talk, talk about some of that, uh, some of those ways that the Michigan Science Center makes science fun, makes it interactive, because we've talked in the past about a number of different events, about a number of different exhibits that have brought that interactivity in, but whether it's a special event or exhibit or just a, a regular day at the Michigan Science Center, that's pretty commonplace. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting the way you say that. And um, as I think about it, I would say that um, one of the ways that we approach it is, is how we approach teaching and learning. So, um, you know, in the best environments, I might venture to say that you, you can't tell who's the teacher and who's the learner <laughs> when you have that relationship around learning, right? Because we're, you know, as teachers and as educators, we are trying to find the best way to communicate and be relevant and accessible to people in terms of content. But some of the content is, is kind of uh, challenging. You know, we talk about astrophysical concepts, about whether there's dark matter in the universe or not. Or uh, we may just describe about mitosis and cell division. Or we might talk about viruses and, um, and, and ways in which they might attack uh, cells, healthy cells in the human body. All of this, uh, the, 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 the way I think to approach it that really works for us is we start Start with things that are cool first, and then we try to extract the science within them. So we don't necessarily take a, a, a topic like momentum, you know, P equals MV, and uh, to determine the momentum of a particle or an object or a car rolling down a hill. Um, what we do is we start talking about cars. And when people are interested in cars, then they learn about the physics and the science and the technology and the math behind it. So Math Alive is an exhibit that we've had uh, this year. It uh, ends towards the um, beginning of 
uh, I'm sorry, the end of April this year. So you definitely need to come see it. It's an exhibit which starts with all the cool things in life and then teaches you the math. So that's the approach that we take in our informal science. A uh, little different than K-12, which is more formal. There's no exams, there's no tests. We just want people to tap into their own innate creativity and intelligence and have fun while doing it. And, and what's great is that you're participating in these individual programs that uh, the Michigan Science Center is putting on itself, but also in, in national partnerships as well to bring in some of these different uh, oh, artifacts yes. and these different exhibits to really give a broad scope of, of science and other concepts uh, to the people of Michigan and those visiting Michigan and going to the Michigan Science Center. Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, this Sunday, uh, this isn't open to the public, but this Sunday I'll be on site to meet with our Smithsonian partners. We have what's called a Smithsonian Spark Lab, um, which is a uh, designated area in our facility that's dedicated to invention education and creating the inventive mindset and inventive spirit in all. And um, we will be meeting with them to talk about how we want to upgrade our space and do some fun things to get people excited about inventing things. You know, if you think about it, this invention uh, process is something that happens in, in your head uh, a lot of times. You're in the shower or you're cooking or whatever. You think about an easier way to do something. You come up with an idea and then you see it on TV and you're like, wait a minute, that's my idea, right? <laughs> well, this happens every day and we want kids to learn how to sort of capture those moments and ideas and um, develop processes to be able to take their invention potentially to market. So this is an important thing that, you know, we're in a, a very uh, in, inventive, ha heavy, um, you know, part of the country that has a long history of different kinds of inventions, both in terms of products and processes. And uh, it's a nice, fun thing to do. And so making those partnerships with uh, Smithsonian as a Smithsonian affiliate, which we are, is a wonderful way to do that. I'll also mention just quickly, we also work with NASA, the, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Many people are familiar with NASA from the moon landings or the shuttle program, or even um, the work that NASA is doing with the brand new James um, Webb Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb was a was a NASA administrator um, during the, um, during the um, moon landings in the process, and it's named after him. And hopefully that particular telescope, which is a space-based telescope, will discover all kinds of cool things. And we'll be bringing them right here to the Michigan Science Center and getting them out to you. You can learn more about the Michigan Science Center, all their events coming up and, and all their exhibits currently, as well as their 4D theater by visiting their website at mi-sci.org. That's mi-sci.org for more information on the Michigan Science Center. We're, jo we're joined by its president and CEO, Dr. Christian Greer, on the Michigan Megacast. Uh, they're currently number two ranked in the USA Today's 10 Best Museums in the U.S., so right just, no, just in between the Center of Science and Industry in Columbus, Ohio, and the Great Lakes Science Center, uh, located in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, so, have you have you been, uh, Dr. Greer, to either of these museums? Have you been? Let's start with, uh, have you been to the Center of Science and Industry in Columbus, Ohio, a city that can best be described as getting a root canal on your birthday? <laughs> oh wow, that's rough. You know, uh, I've had a chance to be uh, to go to both organizations. Uh, they are, they are wonderful organizations, and many science centers are, are very similar. Meaning, most of them have some sort of big screen, um, you know, theater, either a flat IMAX um, or a large a giant screen theater or a uh, a domed. We have a domed theater, and what's unique about our theater is it's actually in the basement of our facility. You know, you don't think about an IMAX theater actually being underground. So our our physical presence um, when you uh, come by the Michigan Science Center looks kind of small, but it's almost like a TARDIS, like a Doctor Who thing. It's bigger on the inside than on the outside because we, we're vertical. We have a 9,000 square foot special exhibit space where Math Alive is on the vertical um, on the fourth floor of our organization. Um, so with COSI, it's more spread out. So they have a planetarium theater like we do. They have an IMAX theater and they also have banks of exhibit galleries. They're much bigger. They're probably three times the size of, of the Michigan Science Center. So there's a lot of room and a lot of space and great stuff to do. And I, and I will say that when you, we're a member of the Association of Science and Technology Centers. I serve on the board of that organization. It's called ASTC or Aztec. And if you get a membership to an Aztec affiliated organization and they're part of the Museums for All through AAM, uh, you can actually get general admission to any of these other organizations. So guess what? Come down to the Michigan Science Center, get a, um, membership, <laughs> and you'll be able to use that to get to 
uh, some of these other, you know, Ohio-based science fairs. <laughs> right, and you'll be able to see for yourself why they are far inferior to the Michigan science fairs. <laughs> there you go, right. <laughs> Tyler, I love it. That's great. Yeah, And Great Lakes Science Center is also a really nice place. They're in Cleveland, and um, they're right sort of uh, on the lake next to the stadium. And so it's a, don't, don't go there on Browns games days. <laughs> but it, they have a wonderful, um, you know, a connection with NASA as well. And um, they work with a local NASA center that's in their area, and they have a lot of space artifacts. And they do a lot of really great programs. And many science centers, you know, we try to work to, together, honestly, to, to help each other. You know, the rising tide lifts all boats, you know. So we, we do a lot of things that um, try to raise the level of engagement and quality of STEM programming, and really to do community opportunities as well. Um, so we have a community free day coming up with uh, sponsored by Exalta, Ducks Unlimited, and uh, the um, Great Lakes Land Conservancy. And it gives us an opportunity uh, on March 20th, it's a Sunday, to be able to host these kinds of programs to get people from our community in. So many of the science centers do a lot of similar things, but um, what I like about ours is we're, we're just a lot more fun. <laughs> we, try, we try to make science exciting and interesting, and hopefully you walk out feeling like a genius because you know what, we're all scientists deep down inside, we're all curious, and uh, we have lots of questions, and science helps you find some of those answers. Yeah, yeah, Michigan Science Center is a very fun location. They do have a lot of fun down there, and they provide fun, of course, for the, for the community, not only in Detroit, but for, in all of Michigan, and for those that are visiting from places like Cleveland, where their city's favorite sport is playing soccer with an anvil. <laughs> We're joined by Dr. Christian Greer. He is the president and CEO of the Michigan Science Center, number two currently in the rankings uh, in the voting for the USA Today's top 10 uh, best museums in the U.S. Uh, so when does this voting go through and, and go, go until and how can people here in Michigan support the greatest museum in, in the entire country, the Michigan Science Center, which is for some reason ranked number two. There's got to be an error there. <laughs> this is why I love the Megacast, right? Because you just put it right on out there for everybody. <laughs> uh, this is really important for us um, in Michigan, I think, to have top ranked organizations. This is one of the things that attracts tourism it attracts families to come and move here. It attracts people to take new jobs in some of our great organizations and industry and companies um, that are ranked some of the best in the world. And um, the cultural scene is really important. So we're based in Midtown, and the Cultural District is a place where we have lots of cool museums, like the Charles H. Wright and African American History Museum, as well as the Detroit Historical Museum, and the DIA for art, um, and, and several other organizations that are here, um, like the Scarab Club and uh, the Car Center, as well as the library. And we're all based in one area in Midtown. We're on the corner of John R. and Warren, and that's where our building is, and we've got uh, ample parking for you to come down and check us out. But it's just a wonderful thing because we have lots of cool events. You know, if I may just take a, a quick second just to talk about our Exalta Free Day. You may be familiar with the ex company Exalta that does coatings for various vehicles and cars. Well, um, this Free Day, which will be on March 20th, that's Sunday, it's coming up, um, its theme is Discover Magic. And we're hoping to have this Free Day, our free general admission for Exalta. We'll be partnering with Ducks Unlimited and Six Rivers Land Conservancy for their support in helping us spark wonder and stretch the imaginations of young learners and the royal color or the color i'm sorry for this year the global automotive color of the year from exalta is called royal magenta royal magenta so i'd love to get a brand new car <laughs> with royal magenta that sounds fantastic but it's a majestic and radiant dark purple hue um, and it has kind of a mysterious you know appearance something that you'd you'd see in a harry potter type movie and uh and royal magenta is going to be the 2022 color of the year for exalta so we're very excited to talk about that we'll have science demonstrations we'll do a various magic related activities like the table cloth trick in which you pull a tablecloth out from under um, some uh, dishes in a place setting. Um, we'll be talking about spectra in space and filtered light, disappearing water and how uh, materials can absorb water. And um, I think we also have something called math magicians. And it's a lesson in using probability calculations to fool and trick the mind and the senses. So it'll be a lot of fun um, happening on Sunday, March 20th, our Exalter Free Day Discover Magic. 
You can learn more information about Sunday, March 20th, Exalta Free Day at the Michigan Science Center and more about all their programs and events by visiting their website at mi-sci.org. That's mi-sci.org. We're joined by Dr. Christian Greer, the president and CEO of the Michigan Science Center. So if people want to vote for the Michigan Science Center, Center in the USA Today's Top 10 Best Museums contest, and they do, uh, how can they go about voting? Well, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, essentially, you can just do a Google search um, and to go to USA Today, 10 best science museums for 2022. And it should bring it right up. You'll see all the different museums there and you just select the Michigan Science Center. So again, go to a quick Google search to USA Today, 10 best, the 10 best science centers. We're currently ranked number two, or actually when you vote for us, it may not show the rankings because towards the end, they, the rankings go dark. But um, before they went dark, we were at number two. We hope to be number one. You can help us get there. Again, search for USA Today, 10 best science museums for 2022 and go to the Michigan Science Center. Dr. Greer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council, we work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me scary and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening why not get your vaccine i don't want this to happen to anybody else 
A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. If you are struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to a $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit or call toll free at 833-511-0311. A public service announcement from 89.3. Lakes FM. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is a source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drain. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, we can find information on all of our entire network, including stations such as My Michigan TV, otherwise known as My My. Joining us now is the Honorable Judge Michael Warren from Oakland County Circuit Court and also the co-creator of Patriot Week Foundation. Judge Warren, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Tyler, for having me on. It's my pleasure. Appreciate having you here with us. Uh, can you tell us about, pa about Patriot Week Foundation uh, and what is the purpose or the mission behind this organization? So Patriot Week is a uh, renewal of the American spirit by commemorating our founding first principles from our Declaration of Independence key documents and speeches that embody those, founding fathers and other great patriots that made those first principles come to life and flags from our history. The week itself runs from September 11th through September 17th. We chose the 11th because of the obvious historical significance of that day. And September 17th is the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. And uh, broadly, we, we have a lot of really cool programs we've had uh, 9 11 commemorations, parades, paloozas, festivals, picnics, uh, panel discussions, many school activities. Um, and we have a very robust um, infrastructure behind that, which you can find at patriotweek.org, which includes a podcast, uh, a video series, lesson plans for students, um, and, and a lot of other resources. So it's not just during the week that we're active, uh, but our focus is um, kind of reinvigorating our civic calendar, which unfortunately has become uh, heavily commercialized and emptied out in a hollow excuse for three day weekends. So we're trying to renew that, that vibrant uh, celebration of America by, by celebrating um, what makes America great in that 9-11 uh, through 9-17 period. Yeah, and what's what's interesting about your, the foundation's work, and, and that, as you said, the uh, the effort to renew 
the spirit in these documents and to reinvigorate the education of these documents of these special days uh, that, uh, that America holds, holds dear uh, is really important because we learn about them in school or, or kids learn about them in school. They learn about them throughout their education, but they learn about them on a very basic level. They get the surface level information. Okay, this is the Constitution. This is who wrote this. This was the Declaration of Independence. This is what's in the Bill of Rights, but not really digging much deeper into how they were formed, into what that actually means for for people today and what it meant for people back when those documents were written. And so how does the Patriot Week Foundation go about reinvigorating that education and diving deeper and helping Americans learn more about these important days and these important documents? Well, you've really hit the nail on the head here. Uh, what we do have right now is a system of K through 12 education. And there's of course shining examples of um, that are outliers that, that really do this well. but. Basically, and, it's, and I'm, I'm not trying to um, dismiss the hard work and efforts of teachers across the country because there's a lot of dedicated teachers that are trying hard, sure. but the system itself is designed to fail because there is so much superficiality of when we teach and it also of, of what we teach. And then also we do a very poor job in uh, coming back to the, to the, uh, the issues and and the documents and the events that you've been mentioning. And so it's really easy to forget those things when you become an adult or even when you're in high school. Uh, one of the things that we have really um, uh, focused on is our Declaration of Independence. And one, one great example of that is our podcast, um, which is uh, called Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics. And we've done a deep dive. We literally go line by line in, and sometimes word by word in the Declaration of Independence, have whole episodes that can go from 30 minutes to a couple of hours, um, dive, making a deep dive on what, what did this word mean? What did, what did the word, uh, for example, unalienable rights is one thing that we celebrate in our um, in Patriot Week. It's a word that um, is kind of taught uh, but there isn't really a deep discussion that our rights um, are not given to us by the government. Um, they're not privileges that we receive because we've been good and the government um, uh, lets us uh, you know, worship our God or um, speak our minds. It's because they're born in us as human beings from nature and nature's God, uh, the creator. And so uh, that's a fundamentally different way of looking at our rights than any other country in the course of human history. And it's it's glossed over very quickly. Uh, sometimes, you know, in fifth grade, it's kind of taught, and maybe in high school uh, for a, a couple minutes, and uh, as opposed to really deeping dive, making a deep dive into what that means. So the podcast is one way that we, we do that. Again, uh, our lesson plans reinforce that. We have videos that are dedicated um, to our, for example, our Constitution. I did a video series where I went through every single um, provision of, uh, not, not to the detail that we have for the Declaration yet, uh, but we went through the, the Constitution as a whole. And now we're starting to do the deep dive in the podcast. Uh, so we, we have uh, you know a number of resources that really go in deep uh, that way. And then for people that just want to snip it, uh, you know, the, the video series and, the, and the, the lesson plans and some of our activities um, can, you know, you don't have to spend five hours learning about a particular subject. You can do something much quicker. We're joined by the Honorable Judge Michael Warren from Oakland County Circuit Court and also the co-creator of Patriot Week. Joining us on the Megacast, you can learn more information about Patriot Week by visiting PatriotWeek.org. That is PatriotWeek.org. And, and so, uh, Judge, why do you believe that... Um, Across the board in, in America, we may have lost our, vigor, our vigorous love for these documents or appreciation for these documents and maybe shied away over, uh, over the last several decades from really taking in what it means to uh, be living by the Constitution or what it means to embody the spirit of the, the Declaration of Independence or why we have certain holidays being celebrated at a at a, a federal level and a state level across the U.S. Well, I think it's been um, a long process, and there's been a number of reasons why. Um, the first is that the academy, that you know, being higher education, um, 
many years ago, back almost uh, more than 100 years ago, decided that they were going to change, uh, make a fundamental shift in how they taught um, history and uh, founding fathers and documents and moved away from the idea of um, really spending a great deal of time learning the documents or learning about the biographies of, of the founding fathers and made it more thematic and less about dates and figures. And there, you know, there's a reason for some of that, I, I understand. But they, they really decided to, to shift the focus. In the interim, there's also been um, the idea of uh, that, you know, okay, so public education was created for two main reasons. The first was we wanted to teach people to be able to read the Bible so they could be saved. And the second reason is that we wanted to teach American history and civics so that they could be active, engaged, informed citizens. And um, so they could, they could participate in public policy debates, not just vote, first off do an informed vote, but also be much, very, very engaged. Uh, because as a republic, um, we don't have a king to tell us what to do. We have ourselves to tell us what to do. We self-govern. But um, that focus of reading and civics and history has been diluted with a whole bunch of other things that public schools have been um, you know, made to task to do, such as not just math and science, but uh, health and cultural issues, a whole bunch of other things. So it's really become much less of a focus in our schools over the years. So not only were they kind of dumbing down and diluting the content that students were learning, but then the amount of time that was put on that task was also significantly reduced. So that's one big part of it. Another part, um, and this is really where Patriot Week comes from, is the idea that we would have these civic celebrations that we would stop on the hustle bustle of our day to renew our, our faith in America. And I, I, I came across this insight when I became an adult convert to Catholicism. And I learned about the liturgical calendar in this idea, like right now we're in Lent. Uh, we just came out of Ash Wednesday and we're in the Lenten season. Eventually there'll be Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter um, and all these other great holidays. And all the great religions have this idea. You can look at Judas, you know, Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and um, Muslims. They all have this idea of a liturgical calendar because it stops you from being subsumed by the hustle and bustle of the day and to renew your faith. And America used to have a civic calendar. We had Washington's birthday, Lincoln's birthday, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving, Armistice Day. Why? To stop in the hustle bustle of your day and to renew your faith in America. And in fact, for example, I'll give you a, a real easy one. Mm -hmm. July 4th, uh, when we declared independence, John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, that the anniversary of that day would be forever celebrated. It'd be commemorated with bells and bonfires and parades, and speeches and illuminations in the sky from one end of the continent to the other now and forevermore. And he was right, we still have 4th of July. But he also said it should be a solemn day of devotion for the blessings of liberty. It ought to be solemnized. I don't know about you, the last time I had a hot dog at 4th of July party was not a particularly solemn occasion. And um, uh, we've, we've also done the same thing with Memorial Day, which used to be a called Decoration Day, where people would go to the graves of those who had given their last full measure of devotion and decorate the graves. Started with the Civil War, but it carried on for many years with, with other conflicts. And now it's a three-day weekend, an empty excuse for barbecues and, um, uh, you know, going up north, wearing white, and uh, having appliance sales. So we've really commercialized and cheapened this day that was very solemn, that you were supposed to really reflect upon how blessed we were because of the sacrifices of others, or on the 4th of July, uh, reading the Declaration of Independence, studying it, Washington's birthday, people would read the farewell address, they'd read his first inauguration. It was, it was very educational along with celebratory. And we've lost that. And so Patriot Week, um, you know, the intention is to bring that back, that to renew the spirit of America by having a new uh, set of uh, civic holidays to to be able to celebrate. And we don't want people to get the days off because that would kill it, right? It would automatically become another empty okay. excuse for parties and uh, trips and all those kinds of things. You even see that now with Martin Luther King Jr. Day. People are 
um, instead of taking that day to do public service or reflect on his contributions, they're using it to you know, go on holiday vacations. Uh, and, and they're now having sales, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday sales. So that's already started to happen with that holiday. We're joined by the Honorable Judge Michael Warren on the Megacast, Oakland County Circuit Court Judge, as well as the co-creator of Patriot Week. Yeah, another minute or so with you before we need to say goodbye. Your daughter, Aaliyah, who helped you create this, uh, this organization, helped you create it when she was only 10 years old. Uh, how old is she now, and is she still doing work with you and the others at the Patriot Week Foundation? Yes, yeah, so she pounded on the table and demanded a new celebration for America when I told her about the demise of the civic calendar. She's 23 now. She's just finished her first year in medical school. She's still very involved. She's one of our um, board members, and she will be delivering. Uh, we have an event uh, coming up um, on March 24th. Uh, next Thursday at the San Marino Club called the Patrick Henry Dinner. That's the anniversary when he gave the speech of give me liberty and give me death. And she's been reenacting it for years. And so she will be react, you know, she'll be doing that again. And we're really excited uh, about that. We have a George Washington uh, impersonator as well as along with um, we're giving out some Patriot of the Year awards. That event beginning at 5.30 p.m., followed by a dinner and awards, 6.30 to 9 p.m. at the San Marino Club in Troy, Michigan. More information, PatriotWeek.org. We're joined by co-founder of the Patriot Week Foundation, the Honorable Judge Michael Warren. Uh, Judge, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you very much. You can learn more information on their website, patriotweek.org. Keep up to date on everything that they're doing. Learn more about Patriot Week. Listen to their podcasts. And, of course, learn about that event they have coming up at the end of March. That is going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. I want to give a big thank you to everybody that joined us on this edition of the program. Of course, the Honorable Judge Michael Warren from the Oakland County Circuit Court, as well as the co-founder of the Patriot Week Foundation. Uh, for being with us on today's edition of the program. Uh, Dr. Christian Greer from the Michigan Science Center, also for joining us in, on the Michigan Megacast, as well as Todd Whalen, the founder of, of Give My Books, givemybooks.com. And those who joined us in the Oakland County Hour, uh, Kathleen, Yon Kathleen Yannick from the Area Agency on Aging 1B, as well as Hillary Nussbaum, co-responder, clinician, and therapist who's doing great work, uh, adding some social work elements into law enforcement uh, and their responses to emergencies and our local communities. Big thank you to everybody that joined us. You can find all those interviews as well as our full episode if you're just tuning in on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also learn more information about everybody that partners with us. This is a massive a partnership between community television, community radio stations, as well as web outlets all throughout the great state of Michigan so that you can learn more about their original programming, what they do to tell you more about their local communities and keep up to date on everything that you need to know about the megacast, civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. Also, highly encourage you to head over to our coronavirus page for up-to-date information on COVID-19 from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division. Yes, we're, uh, we're, we're it seems like we're heading toward the end of, of things here. It's definitely calming down uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic, at least for now. You're going to want to keep up to date, however, as things will continue to change from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division, and stay up to date on everything that's making news here in the state of Michigan as well. Big thank you, as always, to our crew for making this program possible. Calvin Brown, our technical director, with me in the studio every day for this two-hour extravaganza that we call the Oakland County and the Michigan Megacasts. Our uh, Zoom producer out at the office of My Michigan TV in Troy, Jared Clark, uh, helping all of our guests get on the program smoothly each and every day and helping them work through any technical difficulties that may come by as everybody is coming in through Zoom. Larry Nyland, the king of television himself, our producer, booking everybody for this program, helping us get ready to have informed conversations with them about a number of different topics. And Maddie Mushkin, helping us on and off the air out at Master Control. On My Michigan D TV, coming up next, it's Steve Leto live, followed by Larry and Maddie live at 1 p.m. We will return Tuesday morning at 10 a.m.